Hello, I'm Ronnie Eldridge. Welcome to Eldridge and Company. My three guests today all work with women involved in the criminal justice system. Michelle Fine is a distinguished professor at the CUNY Graduate Center who spent her lifetime studying social injustice. Kate Mogulescu is an assistant professor of clinical law at Brooklyn Law School and the leading expert on human trafficking and sex work in the criminal legal system. Sharon White Harrigan is a prison reform activist who currently is the executive director of the campaign to close the women's jail on Rikers Island. It's called Beyond Rosie's 2020. And I'd like, Michelle, thank you for suggesting this program and for introducing me to these remarkable women. So why don't you start off and frame our discussion? Sure. Thank you, Ronnie. It's, um, it's such a joy to be on your show oh, uh, <laughs> with Kate and Sharon. Um, Kate, as, as you mentioned, is a leading lawyer um, around human trafficking, domestic violence, women in incarceration. And Sharon is a longtime activist around closing down prisons and the gender, racial justice and injustice of prisons. Um, she also helps women coming out of prison, right? She's amazing. Like the other two women are goddesses. Actually, all of you, yourself <laughs> included. Um, the project that that we're going to describe here is an incredible um, collaboration among activists, formerly incarcerated women, lawyers, graduate students, and policy making makers, looking at um, the impact of a uh, relatively new law, the Domestic Violence Survivors Justice Act, which was passed last year, which, which is an outcome of decades of struggle around domestic violence and its relationship to women in prison. And I have to acknowledge that you were there in 1985 inside Bedford Hills, facilitating the um, the opening of this conversation from inside. So now outside there's a law that with a whole set of specifications that Kate knows better than I, uh, a law that enables women who are currently incarcerated, who can demonstrate with evidence that they were experiencing intimate violence during the moment of their crime, that they can have their, their cases reopened and, um, and re-examined by the same judge. Um, so Kate came to me and said, can we create an interdisciplinary research and action team of lawyers and graduate students to look at 487 women currently incarcerated in New York State whom we believe might be eligible for this law? I said, I'd be delighted. We have amazing doctoral and master's students in women's studies and critical psychology in social welfare. And then we decided that we needed um, an advisory group of formerly incarcerated women, most of whom are also survivors, who are activists, who are scholars, who have been leaders in this movement to guide the work. And Sharon is um, one of those amazing women who carries experience, knowledge, wisdom, policy, and organizing in her history. So at the intersection of law, social science, activism, we mobilized a research project to help um, support women on the inside who might want to use this law, to also garner legal support for women who are eligible. And then when COVID hit, we used our advisory group to start to generate a list of women on the inside who are older or medically infirm or eligible through the DVSJA, um, so we could slide those names under, under Governor Cuomo's nose for early release. So it became a research project mobilized for social action, but also um, very much um, a grandchild of a project you started in 1985 with a bunch of women inside Bedford Hills. Sharon and Kate can provide all the details. So Kate, uh, this bill passed last year, but let's um, give political, I want to explain some political credit was that the state Senate finally became democratic with some 
new uh, forward thinking uh, progressive members. And that's how the bill passed, right? That was certainly part of it, yes. And um, although, you know, we have been advocating with the governor's office um, for release of these women and many others for years and have been disappointed by his level of inaction. He does get credit for ushering this law in last session, um, particularly as part of the budget with the new Democrat controlled state Senate. So yes, it was a confluence of different factors that led to its final passage after years of advocacy from women both on the inside and outside. So now what, what's happened? I mean, you go back to judges. I know I went back to a judge in the Judy Clark case and the original sending, he wouldn't do anything. There's two pieces to this law. Um, the first is the backward looking piece. So for women who are currently incarcerated, and, and obviously this law applies to men and women, um, any survivor of family violence or domestic violence, but our focus is on women because we understand that for women, the pathways into incarceration overwhelmingly include experiences with violence. Um, there, the two pieces of the law include the retroactive resentencing piece, which Michelle described, which where women who meet the law's criteria can bring a petition in front of the court that originally sentenced them to have their sentence reduced. Um, we are in the process of mobilizing around that right now, identifying who might be eligible, making sure they're connected to legal representation, and making sure that these applications actually have a shot of realizing the law's potential, um, that we don't fall victim to the same sort of tropes, misunderstandings, um, ways in which women's behavior has been looked at historically, that we are not stuck in that same moment now, that this law ushers in actually a new paradigm. So we're working on that on several fronts. The other piece of the law is women currently being prosecuted um, who are in front of a court and are about to be sentenced can ask for an alternate sentence under this law at the time of sentencing. They have to show the same factors, the same things, that they're a victim of domestic violence, that that violence significantly contributed to their offense, and that the traditional sentence that they would otherwise um, have imposed would be unduly harsh. So there's, there's sort of front end and back end relief authorized by this law. And that's pretty amazing if you stop and think about it. There's no other law um, that I can think of that allows a court to go back and take a second look at a sentence, not just because of some formula like our drug law resentencing you know, several years ago, but because the court is really now in a position to reckon more fully with the circumstances mm -hmm. of the events. Um, so that goes hand in hand with the people who are trying uh, to convince the governor and maybe some legislation that people who serve 55, um, 55 years and older, serve 15 years, should automatically be able to go to parole, right? Similar? This is, this is about who we're incarcerating and for how long and yeah. why. And I know you spoke with Steve Zeidman um, a few weeks ago uh, yeah. on his efforts around clemency and particularly the population of people who have grown up yeah, in prison, yeah. been incarcerated for decades. Yeah. And we really have to ask ourselves as a society, why? Yeah. With the group of people that might be eligible for relief under the Domestic Violence Survivors Justice Act, there's another consideration, which is really looking at culpability and how we assign culpability. So there's another layer here but this is not about exonerating people. This is not about innocence claims or DNA evidence. This is about who are we incarcerating for how long and why, and is this the, the, the legal system that we want to see? When you, I have several questions. Do you have to do training, judicial training? Do we, I mean, you're being polite by saying, you know, new facts have come in, but we have a lot of people on the bench who are just plain old fashioned, right? <laughs> in everyday language. So when and I, want, I want, yeah, and Sharon has been in the lead of doing judicial and um, just attorney training on this point, as well as social work training. So I want, I want her to be able to answer this question as well. And I'm not that polite, Ronnie, um, believe me. And I can, I can say unequivocally that our judges and our prosecutors need education around this. Definitely. Sharon. Absolutely. So Sharon. Hi, Ronnie. Hi, Ronnie. How are you? Good? I am great. Thank you. It's a so pleasure you to be talk here. About, 
Well, actually, why don't you tell me about training? Are you training any judges? Well, we are we actually about to do a training uh, for judges coming up, I believe, in July. Uh, we definitely did a webinar for um, attorneys. And, and, and it's very important, you know, I, I think that, you know, when you talk about the legal system that they have their way, you know, as in, you know, the academy for the police, everyone has their own processes and their own way of um, actually training their people. And then it's important that it's, it, and it's not even so much about training, but it's about understanding trauma. Yeah. Right? Interesting. Knowing, knowing where trauma stemmed from and, and having that compassion, you know, in, in regards to people having these traumatic experiences and what does that mean for them, you know, and, and Ronnie, some things just can't be taught. It should be innate, right? That natural compassion of people and understanding that people just actually go through things and, and deal with it in their own individual way. I have a saying that everyone's inch is measured differently. Yeah, I agree with you. Every time I go into a prison, I would think something like there, but for the grace of God goes I, because you can't tell how you're gonna to react to something. And that often has a great influence on what you've done, right? Well, un unfortunately, I have that personal experience. You know, I did 11 years in Bedford Hills Correctional Facility um, behind actually what you would call third party violence. Um, a man attempted to rape me, but prior to that, I was in a domestic violence, um, you know, uh, marriage, right? I was married. My first husband was uh, an abuser. And I mean, you know, uh, in that time, we're talking about uh, the late, the latter part of the 80s, 19, you know, 89, 1990, um, where time where you just really didn't speak about it for many different reasons. And, and also, let's, let's put it out there, the color of my skin. You know, I've made reports and, you know, the police have come and then there's this camaraderie of, of men, of, of brotherhood as as you will right and and they released him you know as soon as they brought him down the stairs and got him around the corner they you know around the block right yeah. absolutely you know so there was no protection for me in any kind of way like you know no matter where i went i literally had to go underground where my parents didn't know where i was i had to leave my daughter for months upon months I, you know, in a hospital with fractured ribs and a fractured jaw and the doctor, a male doctor would, you know, right in front of him, because of course he, he came, you know, would ask, well, what happened to you? You know, and it, you know, allowed him to be in the x-ray room and everything with me. Was your lawyer knowledgeable about domestic violence? I'm going to I'm going to go out on the ledge here and say I don't I don't believe so and you know I, I mean, and it was a great being a battered woman with a record a of male. police <laughs> I'm not I'm not a lawyer <laughs> but that seems you know that's not a good defense right <laughs> I don't know okay well, feel free everybody to just break into the conversation please. You know, our legal system thinks in binaries. It thinks in good and bad and victim and perpetrator and black and white, right? Everything is one thing or another and there's no shades of gray and there's no nuance. The, co the court system can't handle nuance, um, right? The system depends on the sort of churning through of cases without nuance. But these, right. these situations that we're describing, interpersonal relationships, people su suffering from harm at the hands of loved ones and family members, they are complicated. And so to get a court to understand that and see that as impacting what someone should serve as a sentence, um, it's, gonna, it's taking a lot of work. I mean, we are hearing already in some of the very few cases that have been brought under the new law, um, resistance, we're facing resistance because, you know, someone didn't call the police and report when they were a teenager being sexually assaulted by an older person in their community that someone you know, moved back in with a family member who was abusive 
means that somehow they're not a victim and we shouldn't then take into account the harm they were suffering. So there are a lot of places where these cases don't fit into the molds we've created. Right. We need new molds. Right. Yeah, and also, and I'm sorry, and also oh, came oh. to that they don't see, you know, they see you as a defendant, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. But, but they negate the fact that you were a victim, victim. Right. you know, as well. And they punish you for surviving is what it is for yeah. being and, a survivor. And I think the way race is operating here within gender is really important. As we've been looking at these 487 cases, um, one can't not notice how racialized um, the incarceration of women is. And then you have with women of color, not only the intimate violence, but the state violence. So a hesitation to call Child Protective Services or the police to the house because sure, right. for all of what we've seen recently, we've seen a, a kind of doubling of uh, violence at home and then you call the state and you get not protected, but Absolutely. maybe killed, maybe criminalized, maybe your kids will get taken away. And that's a kind of race within gender dynamic. Mm -hmm. We also noticed, Ronnie, that um, we have letters from women who have been looking for support. And some of them indicate, I never mentioned my domestic violence in court. It would have been used against me. Or yeah. the lawyer told me not to mention it. Or the lawyer told me not to take the stand. Or my mother was in the court, so I couldn't mention that my stepbrother raped me. So you get a, a whole set of kind of gendered and racialized mechanisms that keep domestic violence shameful, secret, silenced. And um, in a couple of cases in the newspaper, when domestic violence was mentioned, it was used to um, paint the woman as more culpable, not, not less. So Absolutely. it's it, it, your question's an interesting one. And thinking through what kind of training do lawyers need, do judges need, do journalists need, do <laughs> jurors? need about the relationship between intimate violence, which, as you know, is extraordinarily high among women in prison. Mm -hmm. it's 80 something like 80, isn't it something like 88% of women yes. have been abused in their lifetime? Oh, it's absolutely. incredible. Oh, I'm going to go out and say over 90%. I wouldn't be sure. Yeah, I would say 99.9%. But you know, this when you mentioned journalism, I mean, I, I feel so bad in my lifetime, there were two cases that we organized to protect the women. One was Karen Straw, who was, had called the precinct many times, they'd come and she finally, she was raped in front of her kids and then she stabbed him and killed him and then she was indicted for murder. And we formed a group, a support group, you know, women, I forget the name, we had so many different groups, but we went to every hearing in the court we went to every court session. And of course, we, we got a lawyer uh, who specialized in that, Mike Dowd. And then she was acquitted. The next case, I don't remember which one came her, uh, first, was Hedda Nussbaum. Right. We organized to, to support her and to urge the district attorney, who then was Morgan, that, not to indict her. And it was a very big group. Now, how do we expand that, uh, Sharon? How do we get that public support, regardless of who you are, you know, what class, what well, color, what anything? How well, we that's it. We have to address the racism first. You know, um, domestic violence and intimate partner violence doesn't discriminate, but unfortunately, the criminal injustice system does, you know? And so I think we as you know, as society and as people first need to understand that there is a racial disparity, that, you know, we, we don't, as black and brown people, get treated the same because I, there's no known cases that I, that I actually heard of, of a, of a woman of color getting acquitted. Not Karen, one. Karen did, Karen Straw. Karen Straw, and, that's the, and this is the first time that I'm actually even hearing her name, 
you know, but how many, how many cases, how many, you know, and this is what, you know, we have to, we have to fight, we have to tackle this, you know, we, so many moving parts, but there is this, this big, you know, unspoken, I mean, it's now there's this racial unrest, but prior to that, it's never, it, it just wasn't spoken. Sharon, it's not only race. I mean, all of these issues over the police killings and yes. just having Donald Trump the president, yes. they all coalesce together. It's poverty. Yes. poverty. Yes. It's, it's people who have no money and the stress of no money. Yes. It's people who live, don't have adequate housing. You know, all of these issues come together and it's amazing. Can I ask one question about, not one, but anyway, let's talk about sex offenders, you know, the sex offenders, the trafficking. Mm -hmm. Frequently when, when places are um, investigated or whatever they call when they come in, um, the women are charged with prostitution, right, Kate? Yeah, I mean, there's there's been a quite a bit of work around prostitution policing over the last, I would say, decade um, in really interrogating what's happening there. But I think I think to to connect this to all the themes that we're we're exploring, we should be very deeply cynical and concerned about our human trafficking investigation and enforcement, just as we are about our domestic violence investigation and enforcement, because the same gendered and racialized stereotypes apply there and just like in the domestic violence context with re with respect to at least the commercial sex industry we know that the brunt of the policing and then the incarceration falls on women women of color primarily um, even though there are purported beneficiaries of all this so we can't quite escape whenever we're using the criminal legal system to address a social issue um, that involves poverty, that involves vulnerability, marginalization, we fall into the same patterns of who we sort of criminalize the most. Mm -hmm. um, the reason why I think we all are so hopeful, although cautious about the Domestic Violence Survivors Justice Act, is we see it as acknowledging this in some way, or at least we want to we want to make it acknowledge this in some way. And, you know, un unlike the general numbers of people incarcerated in this country, that have been going down now for several years where we've seen a decline in the prison population, the number of incarcerated women in a very troubling way continues to rise. Um, and so this law, the Domestic Violence Survivors Justice Act, seems to offer some potential solution to address exactly that. And also, um, you know, Ronnie, you mentioned, you mentioned sex offenders and some, some serious offenses. The Domestic Violence Survivors Justice Act actually applies to a, a range of offenses that are usually left out of criminal reform. Mm -hmm. um, so often those, the, any reforms we've seen that tend to work to limit mass incarceration or reform the system in some way exclude violent offenses. The DVSJA, the Domestic Violence Survivors Justice Act, actually applies to a large number of violent offenses that we know women are convicted of. Um, so there's some real hopeful pieces of this that with the collective and the collaborative that we've structured, we're hoping to kind of bring to the surface to show areas that um, of opportunity for yeah. real reform. That's optimistic. I, I, I'm sorry to tell you, but our time is over. And I haven't even talked about Rikers. I haven't heard any of the thoughts after she so well introduced everybody. Michelle, uh, how you'd sum it up. So I hope you'll all agree to do this again. Yes? Anybody say yes? Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. <Okay. laughs> and let, let's hope that, um, well, do you want to finish, Michelle? Once I, I want to say that, that this has been a long struggle by a lot of mostly women who dared to name domestic violence as an ongoing experience across race and class and then as Sharon notes, it's women of color who have gotten criminalized as they are surviving domestic violence, but the resistance has been mobilized because women like you and your generation and so many now survivors and um, allies like ourselves have entered this struggle. So as Kate said, it's a very hopeful moment, 
but we got to make good on this law. This law is, an, is only as good as the organizing and the um, and the recognition of of the women who are inside and hopefully coming out. So thank you very much, Sharon, Kate, and Michelle. And I hope we see you again soon. It's so nice to meet you, and I hope see we talk again. Thank, thank you for inviting us to do Bye. this. Thank, thank you. Much.